Well, everyone, welcome to the Big Top. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jill Clapperton. Um, I'm coming to you from the United States via the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to talk a lot about yesterday. We sort of did the big overview where we linked soil health to food, you know, to food nutrient density. And today, we're really going to talk about how we get to that nutrient density. So how do we build our soils so that we can have nutrient density? Um, and so this is more of the practical part, which actually I admit that I really love, because as a farmer and a, a rancher, um, you know, this is, this is the best part, is about learning and practicing um, how to build soils and whatnot. So we're going to go on that little journey with me today. My details are there on the screen, so if you want to email me at any time, um, feel free. Uh, we have a website, we have various, you know, Twitter, Instagram, all those other good social media things, so um, you'll be able to find us. You'll also be able to find me at jillclapperton.com, uh, so it's not hard. So if you need to get hold of me, we can make it easy. So the first thing we're going to do, you can't do any of the things that I talked about yesterday, unless we put roots in the soil. It's all about the roots. It's all about building soils, having good soil structure. So let's just jump right in there. So on my network, we did this whole, we've been doing this whole series, and we'll do it for the whole year. We've been asking people, what is regenerative ag? What is it? It's a movement of some kind. It's, uh, and everybody has a different answer. My friend Temple Grandin will tell you that um, you know, we know a lot about what it isn't and maybe not so much about what it is. But I think we know a little bit about what it is. What it is about keeping the soil undisturbed. It's about keeping the soil covered. It's about integrating livestock if we can. It's about reducing inputs, uh, definitely about reducing inputs. It's, I would like to see it be about diversity. Um, Definitely all about healthy soil. And I think my friend Gail Fuller, a Kansas fellow Kansas farmer, said to me, it's life. And I think that sums it up perfectly. It's life. It's life unlimited. That's what Regen Ag is. It's, and, and it's bringing us all together in this tent today and, and in this amazing conference called Groundswell. So let's talk about what this is, OK? Biology is at the top always because it's integrating the chemical and the physical properties. If we don't have soil that's alive, then how can it be healthy? If it's dead, it's just dirt. Well, you know, it's just going to fall to pieces and we're going to struggle with it the whole time. So we need it to be alive. And there are things that we can rehabilitate soils with to make them alive. But I think that this is the model for the new for regenerative ag, which is going to be the new conventional. I want to see this as being something that everybody's doing. We're all thinking about reducing inputs. Well, how can you not with the price of nitrogen and fertilizer, right? You're thinking hard about how do I reduce inputs. So one thing is, is that soil health is definitely linked to soil productivity. But I don't want you to think about abundance, yields. Think about the quality of the food. Are you just producing a whole bunch of calories? Or are you producing something that's really good for people and good for your livestock? We need it to be good for things. So let's not, I mean, I want you to produce, we want to maintain our yields. It's not like we can afford not to. But I think we can have more for less. And I think that's what I'm going to talk about today. And ultimately, if we put all those nutrients that we're putting on the field and we use them more efficiently, we're not going to leak into the environment. And that's probably one of our biggest things right now is we need to not leak into the environment. But who can afford that? We can't afford that leakage, so let's not let it happen. There are many ways to no-till. <laughs> you don't necessarily need a big tractor. Um, you can, this is a perfectly fine no-till drill with hydraulics and everything, the Amish people. So, you know. You can do no-till. If they can do it, so can you. We want to create soil wellness. And that means if you're grazing, don't, don't be overgrazing. Because that causes problems, too. And we'll see that in the rainfall simulator. We don't want a whole lot of bare ground. We want to keep the ground covered. 
We want the water to infiltrate. We want to fill the whole profile with water. We don't want it to just run off the surface and contaminate groundwater. People think that the contamination is just nitrate. It's not. The biggest problem we have, and we think about the Great Lakes of Canada and the US, is sediment. It's the sediment, it's the soil that actually comes with all the nutrients that causes the problems. It's much bigger than if we just ran water with some nitrate in it. So that's the last thing we want to do. Keep the, keep the water. We want to be able to say, if our neighbor comes up to us saying, oh, how much water did you get yesterday? How much rain did you get? You say, all of it. <laughs> because you're going to infiltrate all of it. So when our soil is healthy, our plants, they just they germinate quickly. They don't, the seeds don't sit in the ground and rot. They don't have a chance to die. <clears throat> Our plants are growing rapidly. We have all these soil services that are really important to growing our plants, to creating a better environment. We have a lot of these guys in there. I have to show these pictures. Uh, Byron Lee from Ag Canada, who is a scanning electron microscopist, he lovingly did these for me. And it's, it's, a, it's a real task. Um, and because you have to mount these tiny things on, the, on a pin, and then you have to dust them off, and then you have to coat them, and then you have to take a picture of them, and then he, then he lovingly takes them into Photoshop and makes them look like a Vogue cover. Actually, they, I think they look more like a sci-fi movie, but they're real. And this is, look at this. This is, this is these again, but showing you on the head of a pin. This is how tiny they are to give you a little bit of scale. Those ones that I showed you were magnified almost 25,000 times their size. So it's a good thing these guys are all little, right? Otherwise, we'd all be running around terrified. We want to make a soil a habitat. And when we have a habitat, it means we have predator-prey interactions, and that's why they're highlighted. Predator-prey interactions are what allow our soils to recycle themselves. When we start to make the transition, quite often we get a lot of all the biology in the soil, the bacteria and the fungi have just gone, woohoo, we have a habitat. Let's put some energy, let's all grow and, and you know, really take advantage of this habitat. They're really, 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 really good at, um, they're, I'm, I'm sorry, there's somebody who's talking or I can hear, I can hear somebody playing something? OK. Oh, it's the other tent. OK. Sorry. I just can hear something in the background, and I just, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so anyways, predator-prey relationships, they recycle everything. And what we, what we understand and what we hear uh, and what we know is that when we have um, a lot of bacteria and fungi growing rapidly, they can outcompete the plant for the nutrients. And so they take up all the nutrients. And often we see our plants starving. And we have to use a little bit more fertilizer because our plants are hungry because the bacteria and the fungi have just gone crazy over you know, the fact that they have a habitat. And then we need the predators come in because then we can start feeding on all those bacteria and fungi. Because bacteria and fungi can grow a whole new generation in 24 hours. So if you can grow a new generation in 24 hours, you can outcompete plants. One of the best ways that characterize a, a healthy soil is soil structure. So this is the kind of thing. You can do this easily. And you can evaluate your own farm this way. Take a core, cut a pot bottle in half, run some water through it, see if it's running clear, see if the soil's breaking up. If it's breaking up, you know you've got some more work to do. Compare the treatments. Maybe you've cover cropped this one. Maybe you've just taken out of a lay. Compare, always compare. See where you're going. The most important thing with all of this now, though, is increasing the soil organic matter. That's what it's all about. And that's another measurement that really characterizes healthy soil. It is about having more organic matter in there. So you want to be measuring your organic matter on a, you know, probably once every two year basis and do it the same way and make sure you always sample in the same way. If you can geoposition, like actually take a GPS point and always take your measurements there, you'll find that's more successful. But in the end, the whole idea is to improve our soil function. We can see <clears throat> that increasingly 
with no-till, we're making more soil organic matter. We are improving soils. And so that's part of how this regenerative movement really started, is about no-till. And we've moved on from there. I mean, we, we were talking about this the other day, is in the United States and Canada, we are now easily 70 to 80% no-till. So, you know, it's become, let's talk about cover crops and let's how I can tweak the system. How can I optimize the system now that I've created this habitat? Well, one of the ways is to grow roots. And I just wanted to show this picture <clears throat> because you can see the oxidation of the carbon. You can see where the, the root exudates have leaked out in those black streaks coming down in that gray wooded soil. If you look at the other one, it's an earthworm channel. And earthworms have slime on their bodies. And as they move through, they leave the slime. And it's full of carbohydrates. And it's full of calcium. And it's full of nitrates and, and ammonium. <clears throat> and so roots love to grow down these channels. And they love to grow down old root channels. Because they're a safe place to be. They've got more nutrients. It's easy to move. You don't have to spend a lot of energy to explore the soil. Because remember, plants are using energy to explore soil. And we don't want them to use too much because that, that hurts our yield. So the whole idea is to make it easy for them. Root morphology. The key to all of this diversity is to think about why do I want to grow a cover crop? Why do I want to have companions? What are the issues in my field? What weeds do I have? What does my weed population look like? Do I have a disease problem? If I have a disease problem, what plants would work with that disease? What plants would exacerbate that disease? So example, if I'm in sunflowers, the last thing I want to do is grow a crop that's going to also have sclerotinia, because all I'm going to do is cross-contaminate my field. So you have to think about these things. It's actually pretty tricky to do this. Fortunately, we have a lot of resources now. But I love these when you put them in cores like this. You can see the roots. You can see the pea roots. Deep one root and then all the side branches. The phacelia is the one that's at your far left there, far right there. And look at the fine roots. If you have sandy soils, think about using phacelia. It's the best thing for aggregating sandy soils. It's beautiful in that regard. So actually think about the plants that you're putting in there, what you want from them. Because I really believe that plants can solve our problems. And it's the carbon. Every single different plant you put in the ground has its own unique signature of carbon. It's going to put out its own unique leak, its own unique signature. And that signature is going to say, I'm a legume. I need rhizobium. It's going to say, I'm having some issues with nematodes grazing my roots. Hey, I need some nematodes that prey on, on, on insect larvae. Plants are actually very active. They are participating in their environment all the time. And it's that carbon that drives the whole of the food web. <clears throat> rotations, rotations, rotations. Once you have a particular reduced tillage system or no-till system, then it's about making sure you have your rotations as well. Plants, some plants grow better after others. Some plants after flax, wheat after flax will always give you a better yield. Um, it's just there are the mycorrhizas, it sets up the soil, it primes the soil. The crop before primes the soil for the next one. And so really what you're trying to do is create, okay, if I use this crop, then this one's going to be better, and this one's going to be better, and this one's going to be better. And we're all trying to build carbon, and we're all trying to build soil organic matter. So let's think about more roots. How do I get more roots? Well, we can put companions between our cash crop, and I'll show you some of that. We can intercrop. We can put forage crops in between our cash crops so that we have integrated livestock grazing and we get so many more roots. And this is a very old data. But it really tells the story of how important organic matter is for water holding capacity. This is how you get it all. This is how you hold all the water this is why we don't pond. This is how we don't run off. We put organic matter in the soil. So this is the part where I know it's 9 o'clock, and some of you danced the night away last night. Um, what's going on? And you just can shout out. Um, what's going on with all those bare spots or those brown spots? 
What do you think's happening there? There's no wrong answer, by the way. Oh, you're all farmers. I'm sure you have something that you can say about that. What do you think's going on there? And I will stand here and we'll just keep going until somebody says something, so. Pardon me? Wind erosion. Wind erosion. Yes, it was partly wind erosion. Anything else? Yes, depth of soil. Yeah, it's, it's actually because it's eroded knolls, so that's actually very steep, and, it's a, and, it, and it rolls like this. And so as you hit the top of the crest of the knoll, the soil erodes very badly, and there's no organic matter anymore. So what we did is we got somebody very clever to start pelleting organic matter. You can pellet manure, you can pellet um, composted yard waste, and we pelleted it because if you put it in a dust, and you put it and mix it with the seed in your drill, it's really dusty and it clogs your drill and all those things and then you waste a whole lot of time. But the pellets, we can actually put in furrow with our seed. And it creates like this sponge around the seed and it's got all these nutrients. So he's like, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, wow, look what happened the next year. We just added these pellets into the drill, seeded our crop and away we went. Other things you can look for. Sometimes we need amendments to go forward. Nothing wrong with that. Soil organic matter, and it's not just about how much organic matter. It's about the quality again. We're going to harp on this quality thing all the time. It's about quality. It's about the quality of the organic matter. I can make lots of really poor quality organic matter. I can make quality ma organic matter because our organisms, they need a balanced diet too. They don't want to just be eating carbon all the time. In fact, they don't like it because if they eat carbon and they don't get enough nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and trace minerals, they can't work either. And in that situation, something really awful happens. So one of the pseudomonads, which is a bacteria in the soil, which actually is really important for biocontrol, if they don't get enough iron and trace minerals, they start looking around at the neighbors. And they go, oh, you have enough. And then they produce hydrogen cyanide gas, gas the neighbor, take their minerals, and move on. Well, if that's all happening in and around the roots of the plants and you're getting hydrogen cyanide gas, guess what happens? The plant doesn't like it much either. And so we start to have this lag in the plants. So this is where managing your nutrients. When you make the transition, make sure that you don't cut back too much on your fertilizer right away. Make sure that you're always using trace elements. And really have a look at the roots, like get people to dig pits especially your breeders. Get them to dig a pit. Look across. How deep are those roots growing? What plants do I want? And roots, once again, roots are the most important thing for putting carbon in the ground. We focus above ground. It's not about how much residue. I do need residue on the soil. Let's not kid ourselves. I need to armor and insulate the soil. But if I'm going to build organic carbon, if I'm going to take advantage of carbon credits, if they happen and whatnot, then I need to have roots in the ground and I need to have them all the time. And like I said, carbon in the roots is more important than anything else. So now we have this balancing act. We need to decide, we need to have a balance between above ground and below ground. We need to have a lot of roots, but we also need to have crop. So now we find the balance. Well, if we have a monoculture, you can see what happens. If we have a mixed culture, we can start to create a root canopy. Now, if I grow in between the rows of those plants, something else that's a bit deep-rooted, I can start filling the profile even while I'm taking a cash crop. So one of the farmers I work with, Lauren Steinlogge, he actually he starts with wheat and with his winter wheat, and then in his winter wheat, he goes ahead and he puts soybeans into it. He harvests the wheat, and then the soybeans grow up over it, and then he harvests the, ho and then he harvests the soybeans, relay cropping. They do a lot of that in France as well. But again, that's kind of like a twofer, right? You get two for one, um, but you also get all these roots, and you get nitrogen from the soybeans. It all works together. So we're trying to create a balance that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a balance. We're trying to create soil that looks like this. It has that beautiful crumb structure. We know that that means all the nematodes are running around eating all the bacteria and the fungi and the 
protozoa are running around eating all the bacteria and the fungi. We're recycling the nutrients and we're recycling all in that area around the roots, which is the rhizosphere. And the rhizosphere is the most biologically active part of your soil, without a doubt. It's where all the action is. It's what you have to pay attention to. So, you, and you can't separate it. Plants actually influence soil structure. Plants, by their leaking of their, chem, of their soil carbon, actually create the microbial community around their roots. And they create the microbial community around the neighbor's roots a little bit too, and sometimes they share. And soils are not just a static medium, they're always dynamic because they're alive. The mycorrhizosphere, 85%, more than 85% of all our plants form mycorrhizal associations. And, and actually, Oxford is the home of the first work on mycorrhizal fungi done by Dr. Jack Harley and followed up by his daughter, Dr. Sally Smith, who has moved to Australia. And that's where it started, was in Oxford. This is how we started to know about mycorrhiza and how important they were in the grasslands, but also how important they became to our crop plants in finding all the micronutrients and finding all the phosphorus that goes into the plants and networking all the plants in the row so that the water is moving between the plants, the nutrients are moving between the plants. That's how important they are. And they also, because they can't live without a host, they make sure that host is looked after. Now, it's totally selfish on their part because they can't live without them. So they're gonna make sure that they get enough nutrients. They're gonna make sure that they get enough water. They're gonna confer disease resistance upon them because they need that host. And the plant, on the other hand, has to trade carbon. So who is the original carbon trader? Mycorrhizal fungi. They've been trading carbon for centuries. They've been asking the plant to give them some photosynthate so the, they will give the plant the nutrients and the water they need and confer the disease resistance. Mycorrhizal fungi also increase the rate of photosynthesis. Because they allow the plant to shuttle more carbon in the form of amino acids and organic acids to the roots, it means that they stimulate photosynthesis. And that means that we get all these other added benefits of that. So now, what did I say about roots and carbon going down? Now if they're all mycorrhizal, more carbon, more roots, more hyphae, more soil structure. And I'm showing you the, I'm showing you the yellow color here because this is a test you can do at home. You, if you're ever worried, you go, well, should I buy an inoculant? Should I not buy an inoculant? Get your soil, put it in a pot, sow some onions. And Because onions are easy. They just form long straight roots and you just pull them out, dip them in water, and you can just have a look at the yellow color. And if your roots are fairly yellow, you have a lot of inoculum potential, and don't worry about it. If you have no yellow on them, then go and get an inoculant. But if you're going to buy an inoculant, I'd really, really, really like you to buy one that has multiple species. If we're going for diversity, why buy one mycorrhizal fungi? That's ridiculous. Buy a whole bunch of them. Make sure that it has a mix. So this is just a look at the yellow color. And you can see, actually, in the control route, we had one get away, and we created some more yellow color. The color is actually light sensitive. And so you can't hold them in the light for very long. So it's a really you know, sort of flash in the pan kind of thing. Get a white piece of paper and sort of throw them on there. And you, there's even a method, and I've got it up on the website, but there's a method that you can just put them on a grid paper and give a percentage and actually start understanding how much more colonization you have. Roots leak, and I talked about leaking, but everybody's like, well, yeah, and you're trying to visualize it in your head. Well, this is a visualization of it. And plants have all different pHs. Some plants are, and, and plants have specialties. Like buckwheat, for example, specializes in uptake of magnesium, calcium, and phosphorus. And it's all about those minerals. Some of them like other minerals. Um, and everyone has a specialty. And you can see there that faba beans, legumes, actually leak a lot of acids. They leak a lot of acids because they need to feed their nodules, which need a lot of zinc and need a lot of phosphorus. 
and they need a lot of iron, and they need trace minerals, including molybdenum. They also have mycorrhiza, so they have to trade carbon all the time. So they're actually leaking things out so they can get all the minerals they want. Usually they tend to be a little bit more acidic. You can see soybean has both, and then you see corn is not very acidic at all. In fact, it tends to be a little bit more basic. Very mycorrhizal, corn is very mycorrhizal. All our warm season grasses and plants are very mycorrhizal. But the whole point is here, then that microbial community is also adapted to the pH change, right? And then if the pH changes later on, then they have to adapt again. So that's why we need the diversity, because we always have to have this microbial community around the plant that really supports it. And plants have a lot of ways of getting what they need. So you need to make sure that the habitat has what they need in it, and they will get what they need. We don't always need to pamper them so much. In fact, that makes them fat and lazy. They need to get out there and start using what Mother Nature gave them. So how, do we use, how can we use all this? This is a beautiful slide from um, Professor, Professor Buchner um, that works with DSV Seed, and it shows you all the different roots. You can see the yellow is the biomass, and the green is the length of the roots. This is a beautiful way in which you can pick which roots you want. If I have a shallow-rooted crop like flax, well, I could put a deep-rooted crop beside it as a companion. Or maybe I could actually intercrop with a deeper-rooted so that they're not trying to get at the same resources at the same time. And this is what we've done here. So this is sunflowers. And they're intercrop. Well, it was supposed to be a companion crop of, and you can see the bit of red there, crimson clover and faba beans. <clears throat> it turned out that actually after the sunflowers were harvested, we could harvest the faba beans too. We didn't know that. That wasn't the experiment, but it worked brilliantly. And this is in southern Alberta, right next to the mountains, um, on 300, inch, 300 millimeters of water. So you can see what you can do when you start to have good soil. We want to reduce the leakage from the system, and having a green plant is always going to help us reduce the leakage from the system. We don't want nutrients leaking out. We want to keep them in. So this is a way we can do that. It, I, I kind of liken it to taking a vitamin. If you take a vitamin pill, well, you take a vitamin pill, probably you're going to excrete 40 to 60 to 80 percent of it, depending on your health. Fertilizer is a bit the same. And we can lose a lot of it. So the important thing is to be spoon feeding on a regular basis rather than putting it all in at once. Because we don't want to lose it. It's too valuable. And, and once again, here we are building. If we can integrate livestock, um, you can see the, the value in this crop. Finishing cattle on cover crops, all about you know, grass fed. In this case, it's fed a really lush environment one that the cattle love, that they do really well on. We can put anywhere up to five pounds a day on these cattle. Um, and everybody who's been doing this has been making more money on cattle, and they've been going at the highest price at the yards because we're finishing them on covers. But the, what they do, I finish them on the forage, which is also a cover crop, and then what happens? Well, I get the manure, I get the urine, I get the advantage of all the roots, I build carbon like crazy. This is one of the fastest ways that I can start to build carbon in my soils. And animals have this amazing effect on soil microbiology. This is phospholipid fatty acids, which actually shows you the amount of living microbial biomass. So if you look at those purple bars, clipping is the C, grazing exposure is the GE, clipping exposure is the CE, and then we have the grazed and the ungrazed on native grass. And you can see what happens. When we graze it, all of a sudden, the microbial biomass just revs up. Now, is that because of the manure in the urine? Possibly. But it's also because when cattle wrap their tongue around things and they pull, the roots start leaking more carbon. And so then we start to build more microbial activity. So not only is it the, the excrement from the animals, it's also about the tugging and the pulling and their saliva. I want to talk about plant diversity, because if you're really going to build this, you have to think about plant diversity. 
Can I grow warm season grasses? If you can, you'll build way more carbon than you will with cool seasons. <clears throat> if you can grow corn and, and millets and you know, some of the warm season grasses, if you can grow sunflowers, if you grow safflower, you're going to put more carbon in the ground. You just are. It's because of the way they photosynthesize. Um, and you can see here, I'm, as a C4 plant, a warm season plant, I'm using 180 milligrams of carbon dioxide per leaf area. With a cool season grass like wheat or oats or barley, I've only got 60 milligrams. So it's quite a dramatic difference. So that's why we want to try and incorporate warm seasons into the systems. There's another reason to also mix up broad leaves and grasses, because they take up different things. They pull different things out of the soil. And so if we put everything into an organic form, it can't leach, it can't volatilize, it means that it's there for decomposition. It means that it's always there and always available to the plants. It means that we're feeding the, organic, the, the microbial biomass and all the beautiful soil biota. And you can see the difference here. So I'm going to show you this. This is a multi-species on one side, yellow mustard on the other. And look at the soil. I want to break up compaction. I want to change the soil structure. I'm going to go for multi-species. But if I've got a lay or a grassland, a, a ryegrass pasture, it's really struggling. It's looking a little yellow. You know, it's being really apathetic. It's just sort of laying. It's not doing much. So a mustard in there. And you'll see it snap out of it almost instantly. And if you could do a little bit more diversity, why not? Stitch your pastures. Go in there with your direct seed drill, with a disc drill, and over sow your pastures. Perk them up. You don't have to put up with a lazy pasture. Perk them up. Get more diversity in there. Have more nutrition. And diversity is really the key. It's about pests and pathogens, too. We don't need diseases and things like that. And the last thing we want to do is use a whole lot of pesticides, like insecticides and stuff. They, those are really nasty, so we need to keep away from those if we can. This is intercropping. Um, in this case, we have winter triticale with buckwheat. So, the, of course, the winter triticale was seeded in the fall, and then the buckwheat was seeded in early. They're maturing together, and we'll harvest them together, and we'll separate the seed, and we'll sell them. Now, the beauty of this crop is that with all that buckwheat, we're supporting bees. We're supporting beneficial insects. There isn't an aphid in there that could be alive. Um, you know, that's the importance of doing this. And look at how beautiful that is. There's also the happy factor. Flax and chickpeas are the no-brainer. When I talk to Derek Axton, a farmer in Saskatchewan, he'll tell you that if you're going to start anywhere with intercropping, this is where you start. Flax and chickpeas are flax and lentils. Or, if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, canola and peas also works very well. Um, mustard and peas also works. But now you can see there, well, I could use a grass herbicide, but quite often I've got like a cereal and then I've got a legume. Well, I can't use a herbicide. And people go, well, what will I spray? So the whole idea is that you don't because you've got the soil covered, you've got the weeds, weeds smothered. The idea is not to use anything. It's to lower your cost of production and increase your yield. Now, the beauty of this crop is that they out-yield. You will get more yield from the chickpeas in this mix than you will by the chickpeas themselves in their monoculture. There's, and the same with the lentils. They like to grow together. We don't always see that, but we do sometimes. And this is all about phosphorus. Chickpeas actually produce a lot of acids that release a lot of phosphorus. They're highly mycorrhizal. They love the heat. They like the dry. Um, and the flax is also a similar way. The chickpeas will have a slightly deeper root, so they're not, and they are both highly mycorrhizal, so they're sharing. I have grown wheat as a, at chickpeas, desi chickpeas, the low-growing, more wild-type chickpeas, with my wheat for a long time. Um, I always make protein. I've never seen a yield loss. Um, they stay really low to the ground, so I don't get any greening on the seed when I harvest it. It's a whole lot better. I, I like this combination, and I do it fairly regularly. I've seen lentils, too. Like, after we've harvested in the Palouse country in Washington, 
in Oregon, um, in Idaho, in the US, we actually will get a lot of lentils shelled out and chickpeas shelled out in the ground in the fall. We leave them and we seed the winter wheat right in there and then we get our companion crop and we get all this nitrogen for free. In the springtime, all those lentils and all those chickpeas and everything are dead and all we've done is got a whole lot of nitrogen for free. So why spray it out? It's all about the intermingling of the roots. Roots touch each other, they share. And you can see the yellow in there. Do people see the yellow? Mycorrhizal fungi, you can actually see them. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go over this, this is from John Pate. It was done in the 70s in Australia. And they showed that roots also leak different forms of nitrogen. And oats leak a lot of nitrates. Um, that's the blue line. The green line that you see there is amino acids. Yellow line is amides, and the red line is ureides, or urides. Um, and as we go towards the left side of the screen, the, the nitrogen compounds get more complicated. And the more complicated they are, the more diversity you build in microbes that can use them. So it's another way to build your community, your beneficial microbial community around your roots. Um, you, the value of covers. Uh, see that, you, you're thinking that's dust that's coming off that mower at the bottom. It's not, it's mustard gas. This is an onion field. And we're making sure we don't have any problems with nematodes and we don't have any other disease problems. We grow a lot of mustards. We grow mustards mixed with arugula and then we mow them and we just leave them on the ground and we prepare ourselves to grow onions. Um, when we're growing onions, this is organic production. When we're growing onions, we are, we're, after, well, we're about halfway through the field in harvest of the onions, which is, of course, a very soil destructive process. Um, we are following it. We start the drill on the other side and we start seeding our cover crop immediately. So we're trying to minimize. If we're using root crops, there's no reason why you can't mitigate the effects of your root crops. As the onions, we grow companions in the root crops because onions and thrips and whatnot. So we will grow sweet allicin along. It's a low growing. Persian clover is another really low growing plant that has a lot of beautiful flowers on it, all of which will start building our beneficial pollinators um, and beneficial insects, which will deal with our thrips problem. Deal with our aphid problem. Deal with our slug problem. All these things come from diversity. The more diversity we have, the more diversity of insects, the more diversity of microbes. It's like you start on the above ground and then the next thing you know, you've got all these other soil services and all these other amazing benefits. And ladybugs and the ladybug larvae, you know, the dragons of the ladybug larvae, those things just mow through aphids. Just mow them down. And in fact, if you can get a quiet place and just listen, you can actually hear them crunching them. And once you start having more diversity and you start having a habitat, um, you have more earthworm diversity as well. You're starting to build the soil diversity. Your above ground diversity is just a mirror for below ground. And actually there's anywhere more than a thousand times more diversity below ground. So you start building it above ground, you're gonna start building it below ground. You're gonna start having more soil services. And earthworms are ecosystem engineers. They, do, they build those big macro pores. They put a lot of carbon in the soil they use, all, and you know, when the, earth, when the roots go through the channels of an earthworm, they're really protected because that slime that came off in the calcium is, 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 an, is an absolute habitat for plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. So they're all protected in there as well. You can't, it, it, the thing is, is you get this cascading effect of benefits. And Water, we're gonna talk a lot about water when we go out to the rainfall simulator. You look at that, that's soybeans. Same time of year, this is all done in, Can is in Nebraska. Same time of year, you see the drawdown of the soybeans. Now look at that mix, there's 12 or 14 crops in that mix. Why are they not using more water? Why am I using more water in a soybean crop than I am when I have 12 species in a mix? This is a thing where two and two doesn't equal four and we don't know why. We speculate, 
Remember I showed you how the roots cross over? And they touch each other, and they're all networked with mycorrhiza, and they're moving everything between each other? Well, something is going on here. There's a conspiracy. These plants are conspiring to hold water. And it's amazing. You will see a green field in amongst all these brown ones, and they have more plants than anywhere else. And you're like, why? Because of the roots, because of the fact that they're supporting one another. We are stronger together in communities. That includes plants, and we are alone. And this is the kind of thing we want to see. Do you think there's an aphid or an insect that we don't want getting through this field? Those spiders are getting everything. And not only that, they're catching the dew, and they're funneling it down to our plants. There's not a downside to regenerative ag. There really isn't. You start on this journey, and you proceed through it. The whole thing starts cascading. I was talking to a family back there that said, oh, we've been min tilling for 20 years. And we see the difference. We see it all the time. You just have to persevere a bit. It's not always easy, but there are a lot of resources out there. And especially now that we've had this pandemic, there isn't anything that isn't virtual that you can't find. There are podcasts everywhere. There are things you can listen to, you can watch while you're going around in your tractor that's running itself. I want to thank you all today. Um, this is my company, Rhizoterra. I believe that healthy soil is about having a healthy world. Thanks very much. Um, you mentioned stitching into pasture. Can you suggest some species? And also timing of doing that in terms of comp Okay. Um, okay, the question was about pasture stitching. And can I suggest some species? Okay, tell me, are, what animals are you growing? What animals are you trying to raise on there? Cattle. Dairy cattle? Okay, beef cattle. Okay, is the difference. Dairy cattle are lactating, so we're going to go for more energy if we're going dairy cattle. Um, and, and so... In that case, it depends on your season. You're probably in a rye, mostly ryegrass, sorry, but cool season grasses. OK, cool season grass pasture. Um, in that case, we're going to have great spring grazing because you know, that's when it's all going. But then we have really crappy summer grazing, right? OK, now, so at the end, just as your pasture is starting to senesce but you still got water, you want to go for millets. Think about corn and grazing corn and millets. And that's your opportunity for warm season grasses. Um, your opportunity to put cowpeas, vetches, things like that that will give it a, a protein boost. And then you get a chance to also put more carbon into the ground. Um, and they'll die once it gets too cold. And then that'll allow your cool seasons to go again. If you actually were going farther into the summer, then you could go for a, a cool season fall crop in which case you could grow some cool season winter grasses and, and winter legumes like peas and lentils and things like that that you can feed. Um, so that would, that would be, that's just a start. But I know that there are people out there that can, you know, give you an idea. And, and if you want to, I know this is a, 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 an American resource, but green cover seed have a cover crop calculator that you can actually, and it, it's green cover seed, you can actually go in there and you can say, I have, I'm grazing and I want to over sow. And then the menu comes up and you have all these plants and you can make a mix. I mean, you're not going to get it and send it over here, but at least you can make a mix and then ask somebody else for it, you know, um, and, and go from there. Um, and obviously, you've seen some slides from DSV Seed. Um, Christoph Fentroy, who is now retired from DSV Seed, um, was a master at this. So the seeds at DSV Seed have been created by a master. Just, just saying. And I'm not, I don't sell for them or anything like that, but I know him and he's taught me a lot. Um, yes, you got an, I don't know, you're, you're running around with the microphone, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it alone. She's got it under control, I think. We're going to get her very, she's going to be running around. Hi. Um, how well does it work on cold, in cold climates? How, do, how well does what work on cold climates? 
All of this, we keep talking about sunflowers. Not many sunflowers in Scotland. Ah. Well, we don't grow a lot of sunflowers in Canada either. <laughs> um, in cold climates, you're going to choose different plants. I mean, if you want to get a, a cool season, you're maybe not going to have a sunflower crop, but you can probably put sunflowers in something like a companion or something like that. And even if they only get this big, they'll have a big root system on them. Faba beans, for example, have a really monstrous root system, even when they only have tiny shoots. Um, and, and when you look at, if you look at some of the resources talking about root lengths and things like that, you can get the zones. But what I'd encourage you, and, and this is what I did, I looked at a lot of those things and they gave zones, right? They said, okay, this is the zone where this works best. I ignored them and I said, I need plants that do this. If they were tropical, okay, that's different. But I ignored the zones and I just said, I'm going to try it. And sometimes I was surprised. Things grew that I didn't think would grow very well. Um, so you can do this, but you adapt it to the colder climate. The farther north you are, I do a, a lot of work in Finland. And so, you know, we've got the cold there, but we're growing cover crops in potatoes. We're growing cover crops in carrots. Um, we don't always get the sunflowers higher than this, but um, we get the benefit out of it for sure. Hello. Um, a question. Is glycosophate significant in the soil biology as far as your processes are concerned? And if so, how significant? What sort of science is there in terms of applying a, a weed killer? Okay. Um, I, I'm glad that somebody asked the, the glyphosate question. Um, round up, because um, we talk no-till and everybody just assumes that we're all using a lot of chemicals. Um, that is not true. Um, most of us are trying not to use a lot of chemicals and still reduce the amount of tillage. Glyphosate is, can be used, if it's used inappropriately, um, which it often is, um, and used way too often, um, then we have a problem with it. If you're soiled, if you're not overusing phosphate, and a lot of the farmers have really active soils. We'll use like a burn down with glyphosate sometimes um, first thing in the uh, spring or at the end of the fall. Um, we don't see any residual. And the reason for that is it's glyphosate. So we think about it gly and phosphate. Then if we're not overusing phosphate, then the microorganisms actually really eat up all that phosphate and they break it down. And so it's one of the chemicals that we can actually break down very effectively. Um, but once again, you need healthy soils if you're going to do that. You know, um, otherwise it's going to run off, it's going to go into groundwater, we're going to have a whole bunch of issues with it. Hi, so just a question about um, the talk around regions, often like sort of grass and arable crops and integration. Um, have you got some advice on where to find some information on growing vegetable crops like carrots and potatoes like root crops without damaging the soil. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like our onions and our potatoes and our carrots. I mean, we know that we're digging them up. We know that we're doing tillage. Um, and so what we do, we're really diligent about getting covers in after we harvest or in between. So for example, um, with potatoes, um, in southern Alberta, where I'm originally from, uh, we will grow, we grow um, green peas and, and potatoes, and we'll grow them in probably the same season. Um, and it's wonderful, like with green peas for freezing and canning, um, we can get a cover crop in almost immediately after we take them out. And the equipment that goes in to harvest them is really heavy equipment, like really heavy. Um, and so, you know, that can be... Um, Getting a cover crop in immediately after is a good idea, and we will use things that bust up compaction after that. Um, with potatoes, um, there's another thing you can do. You've got an alleyway in between, your, in between the hills. Um, growing a cover in between the alleyway can actually increase your potato yield. So we actually can grow companions, and actually we've been experimenting with companion crops to grow between the rows of potatoes, and we've seen, if we get it right, we've actually seen, we've gone to like 14 tons, 15 tons of potatoes, um, whereas when we don't have it, we're at seven to eight tons. So, you know, think about looking at some of those. 
Alfalfa has been really good. The legumes in between the rows of potatoes, potatoes are highly mycorrhizal, giving them something that's mycorrhizal, a bit of grass in there to hold the soil. And then when you lift the potatoes, what happens is actually those things come down and we actually, you can seed again and then just keep mitigating. So when we're doing tillage crops, heavy tillage crops, I like to mitigate. So that's what I call it. I'm just, I'm gonna grow covers and I'm gonna grow them after. We use sheep to graze our covers after that um, and it works really well. So then we have the advantage. We're growing a really nice cash crop and we get the sheep afterwards and they clean up some things too. Anyone else? Oh, surely we can't have all, I mean, it's raining out there, you might as well take a break. <laughs> it's dry in here. And nobody else, any, oh, we've got a question over there. I know it's earlier today and we all had too much fun last night, so. Uh, how to deal with alfalfa in no-till? Because herbicides basically not working. Okay, do, okay, so just let, help me for a minute. Um, alfalfa in no-till. How do you do it? Yeah, how to deal after cutting oh. it, yeah. Um, alfalfa, actually you, um, one of the ways we deal with alfalfa, it's, it's really hard because you're right, if you take it out, you know, you're gonna disturb the soil. Um, we do it in kind of a different way. Um, so with the alfalfa, we'll actually cut it, the last cutting, before we're gonna take it out, we cut it really low. Like we, we cut it to the ground. We take a really hard cutting off of it. And we try and take it so that we've got the, summer, like the summertime to sort of really knock it back. And then actually we'll seed winter wheat in there. And the alfalfa will grow back a little bit and provide a lot of nitrogen to the winter wheat. And then we'll take the whole thing out the next year. So it's another way to do it. Anyone else? Okay. Yep. And, and so, yeah, we're going to go and simulate rainfall. <laughs> we're going to go out to the rainfall simulator and actually simulate the rainfall that's happening. I'm just going to make it rain a whole lot more is what really amounts to. Um, so if you want to, you know, gather your things and we're going to go out and do the rainfall simulator. Thank you very much, everyone.